Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek, and today we are talking more about the study of history from a Christian perspective. What are the uh, framing ideas to the way we look at history? So we've talked about what God is doing in history, his plan how we know his plan a little bit. We've talked on, touched on those themes. The big problem with this would be, of course, sin. Sin. What does that just wreck everything? I, I'm sensing negative emotions. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there, there's. I think there are two things we have to address. One is to speak to our brothers in Christ with that question. So are we adopting as Christian a philosophy of history that says the fall changed everything? God had this great plan, the one we've been talking about now for two episodes. And it's never going to materialize because sin, Satan, got in the way, and that's that, and God has had to settle for some other kind of plan, and we can talk about the options. We started to do that last time. Then we can turn to our unbelieving friends and say, wait, we're talking sin. That doesn't mean anything to you, does it? And we're going to find out, no, that's a weird word that no one uses anymore, and it never was a proper um, understanding of the human condition. And so we're, whereas we would like to be looking at, there's this Christian philosophy of history, and then there's this anti-Christian philosophy of history, we inconveniently have the third, which thinks it's a Christian philosophy of history, but we're going to argue, fails miserably. And the consequences it brings to us in our study of history, our appreciation of history, are rather disastrous and could explain why most Christians aren't terribly interested in history these days. So I think that's our agenda. And we need, to, I think, to start with Genesis 3, which I'll read. And then we need to talk about what was Satan proposing? What's the nature of sin? How does the biblical idea of sin stack up against all the things the world would declare to be our problem? And then what happened afterwards? And some of that may have to wait till next time we talk about the promise of redemption. This is Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God had said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom... Thou gavest to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, as Christians, we believe this is history, not mythology. There was a real flesh and blood woman who stood before a real tree and talked to a real serpent that in some sense is possessed by or identified with or in some other form, Satan, a fallen angel, that this took place in time and space about 6,000 years ago. 
and that the consequences of her choice, and more specifically of Adam's choice afterward, have in some ways set the course for Earth's history, and certainly have wreaked havoc on human society and civilization ever since. There's this thing we call sin. God said, don't do this. The serpent said, why not? N nothing really bad will happen. In fact, something tremendously good will happen. But he said, but he implied, don't take my word for it. Go ahead and find out. Which is to say, break God's commandment and see if anything happens. <laughs> it's true empirical science, I suppose, but not very intelligent or certainly not very wise empirical science. Because what, what Satan is saying here is Yahweh is telling you one thing. I'm telling you something else. I don't claim to be the creator. He does. But obviously, since he can't, I'm telling you, he can't follow through with this, right? He's not a creator. He, he exists. He's something. And, and, and perhaps powerful and perhaps dangerous, like a playground bully. But this tree is what it is. And you, in your autonomy, should investigate it, find out about it, because I'm telling you there's magic going on here. There's power. There's transformation. You do this thing, and you will. And he doesn't specify all that he means, but at the very least, you will be as gods deciding good and evil for yourself. You'll be free of Yahweh's control, lordship, um, sovereignty, suzerainty, and you'll be in charge of your lives and probably the lives of lots of other people. And wouldn't that be great? That's sin. It's a promise to say if you sin, things will good things will happen. Break God's law. And, and it's important to, to remember that this wasn't there there was no lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. Eve is the one who repeats back the commandment. You know, sometimes kids get away, at least in school, with, well, I didn't understand. Okay, explain. <laughs> Here's the order. Everyone repeat it back now. We do that as teachers sometimes. <laughs> She repeats it back. She adds to it. She makes it even more difficult than God actually did. God did not say, don't touch it. But she adds that on. Mm -hmm. She is adding already. She's already adding to God's word. And then she's left with a choice. And, and Satan's argument is this, this tree is a fact in itself, a brute fact. Uh, it, it awaits your apprehension. You, you will find in it something of value because it's just there. God found it. He's trying to keep it from you. I've been there. I've seen it. I know what it can do. But you know, why trust either of us? Find out for yourself. Take nothing by faith. Check it out on your own. I'm sure the consequences won't be bad. Can I add in one more thing? Please add in all kinds of things at this point. <laughs> I think I'm done. With reference to Eve adding to the commandment, she's adding to the commandment in such a way as to negate the commandment itself, the the opposite commandment. They're, they were supposed to be dressing and keeping the garden. Mm. You can't be caring for a tree if you're not going to touch it. Oh, <laughs> oh you go to the head of the class. I have completely missed that. That's great. Yeah. Mm. You're absolutely right. I, I pointed it out, this out once, not what you said, but the, the general, she's added to the commandment and condemned her for it. And one gentleman who's been in the church forever sent me an email saying, I think you're being too harsh. I think all she was doing was just being safe, you know, like, let's, <laughs> let's not even get near it. And I wrote back and said, you mean like when people say, let's not touch alcohol because it might make you drunk? <laughs> There's a word for that. It's called Pharisaism. Mm -hmm. It's the sin that crucified Christ. Yes, we may not add to the word. We may not take away from the word. The word is itself. And when we try to defend against Satan's attacks with our own word, we find out more or less what he found out. It doesn't work. It's self-contradictory. We find we have no foundation. And we lay ourselves open to to the temptation and, and to the, the sinful response that arises in our heart. Some people have been um, surprised at this. You mean, you mean she was sinning before she ate? Well, of course. 
You think her hand just went up there, randomly stuffed it in her mouth, and suddenly she realized, wow, I sinned. How'd that happen? She obviously, at some point, chose to reach for the tree, which means at some point before she reached for the, the, the fruit, she'd already alienated her heart from God. Now we're just getting a clear idea of when. Mm-hmm. When, when Satan approached her, rather than stand on every word of God, simply because it was the word of God, she had to put her two cents in. She had to play the Pharisee and add to God's law. By the way, this makes Satanism, because this is Satan's worldview, and the Phariseeism we meet in the New Testament, uh, more or less the same thing. You know, by the time we get to the New Testament, we're thinking, oh, these, these people are not Satanists. They're very upright religionists. And that religion is Satanism. It's the same thing. Sin proceeds from the heart, and at some point yeah, the heart crosses the line. Upright religion led them to crucify yeah. God in the flesh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> should tell us something about the religion of the Pharisees. Yeah, and they're working uh, And with, this fits with James, too, where he yeah. outlines the the life cycle of sin, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that it's it doesn't begin with the fulfilled act. It's desires conceived, brought forth, Mm -hmm. brought to fullness is sin. And that's where it's also important to realize that the tree itself had nothing for her to use to make her decision. Um, There was nothing, sometimes like when we get to the, um, the ceremonial laws, people say, oh, well, God chose that diet because it's healthier for people. And Mm -hmm. they try to say, God did these things because he knows the physical creation and knows that this, you know, will be better for us. There was nothing healthy or unhealthy in the tree. It -hmm. was solely a test of trusting the word of God, not can you correctly use your environment? Um, Can you have the perfect diet of this fruit or that fruit that it was... It was nothing to do with that. And so as soon as she turns to the physical, she's already lost. Yeah. You either accept God's interpretation of this or you don't. The moment you don't, you're an idolater. Mm-hmm. And you don't, it, she could stop there. She could have never have touched the tree. But once she has done that, she sinned in her heart. Well, then what's the fruit all about? There's, and this is perhaps the point where we say, here's the magic word that you're going to hear a lot covenant. God's relationship. And by magic, we don't mean magic <laughs> we at don't all. don't mean magic, no. <laughs> the, the word we keep saying until people are sick of it, mm-hmm. um, because it is the answer to so many things. Covenant, yes, touches our heart, but it also reaches to externals. The word that Adam and Eve had heard was, "You, the day you eat from the fruit, you will die. Now, they are in sin. Well, what if they stop now? But, you know, here's the thing. Once we've abandoned ourselves to sin, that means we've broken free of God's grace. And guess what? We will do what we want. And there's no longer anything to restrain us. So once they had conceived lust in their heart, the act was inevitable. And yet God waited on the act. God did not punish or break the covenant or reckon the covenant broken by the internal sin, but by the outward manifestation. And that has implications all the way down through theology that we won't talk about right now, I think. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it does. it's important to point out there was sin before the covenant broke, before mm-hmm. they broke the covenant by their own choice. But once the sin was there, the covenant breaking was inevitable. Uh, and yeah, they, then, we can flip this around and have a positive example in, in marriage, in love, mm. that you can have love and not be married. Right. And there's a time when you get married <laughs> and that ceremony means something. Yes. Yeah. Because it man, makes a real difference. <laughs> man is a spiritual being who lives and acts in a physical environment. And mm-hmm. these are not separate things. This is the same thing. This is what it is to be human. And so God reckons with us. And this is something that certain parts of the evangelical church have real trouble with. Um, they, it, it, My wife's Bible class of the day, a bunch of uh, fifth graders, I believe, yep. said, oh, no, God, all God, God doesn't care about our bodies. All he cares about is our hearts. I think I mentioned this last time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they're just representing the general attitude of the American church. God's spirit, all he cares about is the spiritual part of us. And... Um, what our bodies do doesn't really matter. Uh, I have seen this manifested over the last two or three years in people who 
professing Christians who've done something pretty bad, and they come and say, well, I talked to God about it, and He's forgiven me. There's no need to talk to my church, to talk to other people who maybe I offended, to talk to people who tried to counsel me and I blew them off. I'm all right with God. My heart's, my conscience is clear. My heart's right. I don't, this, any, asking me to do anything else in the, in the sphere of other people is legalism. It's adding works. I, I, I'm free and I just want to drop it and move on. And we look at the wreckage and carnage that they have created along the way, and they do not see it. They do not see all the collateral mm -hmm. damage because they're thinking, I, I think this is at least a good part of it, they're thinking in terms of, well, my soul to God's soul. Mm -hmm. And radical individualism, mm -hmm. as well as the materialism that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians, where yeah. he says, yes, it does in fact matter what your body does because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, First Corinthians is a good place to go there. Also, First John, which we're working through in, in Wednesday Night Bible Study right now, John is going to present as one, well, two of the tests. Uh, if if you're a Christian, if God, if Christ is in you, then you will love your brother and you will keep God's commandments with your body. You will do the things that are right. It's not an option. Um, the the Bible totally rejects the Greek and Gnostic notion that the true man is the soul and the body is some kind of unnecessary, inconvenient uh, extension into a pretty slimy, gross world, and we would all be better if it just didn't exist. And so, one more time, salvation is dying and going to be with Jesus. And what we're seeing here is, and, and perhaps this is the reason for bringing this up, that sin is not simply, it's not simply something internal. It's not simply a matter of the heart. It has outward consequences, uh, and they show up immediately. Well, look what Adam does. The woman <laughs> that you gave me, and gave is not simply you plopped her in the garden, you gave her to me in marriage. You created this other, this other, use the language of psychology, you created the other, and then you ordained this, this institution called marriage and stuck me in it. So between society and social institutions that I had no say in, it's not my fault that things went wrong. I am simply the product of my society. Now, if you want to give me a better model and a better institution, you want to reinvent marriage for me so it's more congenial to my way of thinking and acting, you can go for that, but don't blame me. Yeah, I did it, but it's hardly sin. And Eve is a little more subtle. Her response used to kind of puzzle me because it seems like there's so much she could say. I think she says it all. The serpent beguiled me. Just let that hang there. Serpent? What ser Oh, this serpent right here in the garden with your husband and God. And they apparently did nothing about it. Well, shh, I am obviously the victim here. So <laughs> what, what else is there to say? Victim. Not to blame. Don't don't point. You don't be. You're all, obviously all three of you are abusive. God, Satan, Adam, because you let this thing get in here, and I have nothing more to say. Just you know, pity me, pity me. And so already, sin is wreaking in is wreaking havoc on basic the basic social institutions, relationships, interpersonal communication, whatever you want to call it, man and woman. It's tearing it to pieces, turning them against each other, mm -hmm. making them, they each throws the other under the bus mm -hmm. uh, to try to escape consequences. And both of them continue to assume that they can get around God. Their worldview has not altered. They went over to Satan's side. Satan was preaching a finite God who can't control everything, doesn't know everything, didn't make everything. And although they are attacking Satan with their words, they're also still attacking God. Okay, so Satan was fundamentally right. He just wasn't very helpful right now at this point. So, you know, it's his fault. But if we just say the right thing with the right, you know, cringing tone in our voice, we can get out of this. We can work around God. God's not all that. And they're still clinging to this idea of a finite God who is part of the creation, there is no creation, is part of this continuity of being thing we call reality. And uh, 
we, 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 we can still work this. We can still make this work. We are not sinners. We just kept bad company. Which is a surefire way Proverbs tells us to become a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Proverbs 1. Don't hang out with gangs. Why would I ever hang out with gangs? You're hanging, everybody hangs out with somebody. There's a, <laughs> uh, I remember that at least one of you does not like good omens. Nonetheless, there is a good line in it. Sooner or Pepper says, sooner or later, everyone has to decide what gang they belong to. And there's <laughs> tremendous truth in that. Uh, evil communication. Side, side point. Yeah. Good omens is one of the first books that my husband David and I read together when we were <laughs> um, courting, dating. Whatever you okay. call it. Mm. So it's you can not, tell which one of us doesn't do that. <laughs> it's not for everybody, obviously, and I'm not exactly recommending it, but they're there. It's dedicated to G.K. Chesterton, a man who knew what was going on. <laughs> but the dedication is announced through the mouth of a demon. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's all right, let's look at this two different ways. They're they're the same way, but you know. <laughs> humanism, all forms of humanism are one. But on the one hand, this is not Bible picture, Bible stories, Bible people, Bible lands, Bible myths, Bible times. Bible times. This is true history. These things really happened and they had a real effect and continue to have a real effect today. On the other hand, this is not the existentialist or nihilist. Hey, they did their thing. Why does that touch me? Well, the thing they did was in the context of a covenant that united them with all of their children. And Adam was the head of that covenant. He was the covenant representative. He was ordained out by God. And when he fell, the human race fell with him. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's an existentialist so consistent as to deny any effect that their father had on them as a person. <laughs> Well, they but they do in theory. You in, know. in theory, yeah, all breaks theory. down as soon as you hit <laughs> reality. Yeah, it does. But you know, um, exist or uh, existence precedes essence. Isn't that it? We 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 come on the scene and we create ourselves by our choices, and and that brings us back to how the world looks at history. So Adam and he made these choices. The Pelagians, the disciples of Finney, the existentialists, all say, "Well, given the given for the moment, let, 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 let's grant this is real history. That was then. I'm now. That was their choice. I make my choices. Every human being makes his own choices. Let's not blame them for our sin. Let's just start choosing to do good because that's all it takes. Once once we once we start choosing to do good, and now the Marxists step in and say, but you know, there's a problem with that." Because let's face it, reality is that bad things happen. Bad things happen on a on a planetary level. Poverty, disease, plague, wars. Uh, obviously, this bad stuff's coming from somewhere. Now, we agree with you existentialists that it's not because man's corrupt, but there are institutions, as Adam and Eve pled here. Uh, there's a socioeconomic environment that corrupts. And it's, it's just too much for the individual to overcome. So now if we combine our efforts to cleanse the world of these sorts of things on every level, the economic, social environment, the um, organic environment, global warming or cooling or whatever is going on this season, you know, if we can fix all these things, then the in, all, of we, all of us as individuals will indeed be free to make the right choices and probably a lot more of us will, and the world will be a lot better place, and and so on. And so history, then, becomes man trying to come to terms with this. And the true prophets, uh, from Plato to Rousseau to Jean-Paul Sartre to the woke movement, it's all about let's gain control of the environment Let's excise anything that will not fall under that control. And given enough time and money and power and knowledge, we'll hand you a perfect world. Because the, the other possibility is unthinkable. Nuclear annihilation. We will destroy ourselves. That's hell. Heaven, paradise, utopia, something we can create if we simply realize where the problem lies. We need to educate. We need to control the media. 
we need to know what everybody's doing and thinking. We need to rem to remove the people who are problems or subject them to proper psychological treatment. We need to more fairly distribute wealth, and we'll we'll volunteer to do that for you. Thank you very much. And we will give you paradise. And so history becomes the charting of that, because the only other possible story is that there is no story. Mm -hmm. That yeah, people screw up a lot. That's it. That's <laughs> and there's the story. no meaning to it. There's, there's no, no meaning no to arc. it. There's yeah. no purpose. There's no direction. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, what falls in between that and a Christian point? And now, now we we peek ahead for for next time. God's about to turn and curse the serpent and promise to do something incredible. He's going to send a hero, a savior, into Earth's history, who will crush the head of the serpent. Now, the language is figurative because simply stamping on the head of the serpent is not going to do anything. But the, the implication is he's going to break the power that this, this moment has had over history. He's going to undo the work of the fall. He's going to turn back Satan's works upon himself, destroy the works of the devil, as John says. And, actually, the writer of Hebrews. And um, the, the, the question then becomes, all right, Christian brothers and sisters, what does that mean? Because here are two possibilities. You, you can create others, but these are, these are two broad things. One, God still has in mind the same goal he always had because it was great and good and pleasing to him, which is why he came up with it in the first place. And he's not going to be defeated by a stupid snake. Or, I mean, that's what it comes down to. What kind of God do we have? Yeah, the snake got God. Oh, that's just really exciting and convincing. Wonderful God you got there. Um, but that is what Satan thought of God. Yeah, well, sure. He thought that he as a, as a snake was sufficient to take down the God of the universe. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because at some level, he does believe his own propaganda. At another level, he no doubt doesn't. But he, he's good at convincing himself and his followers that God's not all that. Yeah, snake can do it. Just a little, a few lies can bring down empires, right? That's all you need. But there's another answer, another way of it looking at history that can give lip service to to God and 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 yet not hold up his glory the way the Bible does. And that's to say, yeah, Satan really did screw things up. Sin is too powerful, it's too deeply rooted in the human heart. And this idea of filling the world full of God's image of people who believe in God, the God of the Bible, trust him, fear him, walk with him, keep his commandments, serve him, and do this in the context of a worldwide community dedicated to the worship and service of, of God, that's just not possible. It can't happen. So God's plans got redesigned. And I think we can talk more about this next time. But this is, again, as I said last time, this is where eschatology comes in, and you do have to face it sooner or later. If God is not, if God's, the point of God's promise is not to undo the work of the fall and to assert his original vision by a new and living way that involves mm -hmm. an incredible mystery that God himself should kick on flesh and die in the place of his enemies. If that's not it, then what's that God after? Well, and, and we get things like, well, you know, God could do that. He's just not going to. The number of the elect is very small. And he's going to save some out of every nation and kindred and tongue, um, a handful, a smattering. Some are more optimistic. I'm optimistic about this. He may send, save lots and lots. I just don't think he's promised to. Okay. And, but, but yeah, the, the original vision that, that worldwide kingdom of God, no, that's not going to happen. Or, or yeah, God's actually going to do all of that. He'll do it by the second coming of Christ, but not by the gospel. The gospel is a completely different sort of solution. And it saves people from sin and sends them to Jesus when they die, and they'll live and reign with Christ in heaven forever. Uh, but any kind of, of anything happening on this world, that's not part of the church's mission. It's, it's actually antithetical to Christianity. That's the Antichrist stream. We shouldn't be encouraging it or supporting it. I mean, you want to vote for a moral candidate, I guess that's okay. But be careful because, you know... 
you don't save the world by politics and you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. And the sooner that the that the world falls under the complete spell of, of Satan's power, the sooner Jesus is coming back, which is what we want. And, and so you have that kind of, of approach to things. There, uh, there's a, there's a deviation on the, on the f first one, which is, yeah, God's not going to do anything, but if he were, Let's talk about philosophy and restructuring Christian society and institutions, but it's never going to happen. So, and, 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 oh, and don't bring in God's law or God's word. Just let's think philosophically about what Christian society mm -hmm. could look like. That's Dutch Calvinism in its deformity, and we're, very few people are on that boat, so I'm not going to worry about it. I just point out that it does exist or did exist. It's very interesting listening to you talk because when we talk about Satan and Adam and Eve, one of their chief, one of the chief aspects of their sin is to minimize God, mm. his power, his dominion. But then we see it coming into the church where we minimize God's intent. We minimize what God cares about, um, what he plans to save, what the effect of Jesus salvation is, the number of people that Jesus is going to save. We, we tend to come from ourselves to God instead of from God to ourselves so that we're small. <laughs> And finite, yeah. and we see things in salvation as small and finite, and not the immensity and eternity of God um, that He then puts into the salvation plan. Mm -hmm. And we see in the in the lie of the devil in the very beginning, you can get to that that point of "you shall not surely die" by minimizing any one of God's attributes, mm. whether it's mm -hmm. He His love is too small. He wouldn't have yeah. said this if he had a greater love for you or his justice is too small because he's not really going to enforce this thing. Um, you can get there so many different angles, but they all just diminish God and give us a false idea of who he is and how great he is and how different he is from us. And often we see that when people say, well, you know, if I was God or <laughs> my God wouldn't, I would never. Again, you're starting from yourself, which is sin at its heart is selfish and a worshiper of self, which always makes God or even ourself when we're God, very small. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we see autonomy in man, it's still a very small autonomy that ends up <laughs> leaving them feeling uh, depressed because we really can't atone for ourselves mm -hmm. or achieve like, congratulations you've got all the power that you could possibly hold and it's this little bitty amount <laughs> yeah. yeah itty bitty what is it living space living space yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um before we we begin to wrap up I, I would like to spend a moment and talk about how losing the biblical concept of sin kind of has landed us where we are because, you know, the church doesn't teach sin anymore. Um, it is very rare that you find a church that will actually say, hey, this thing, it's called sin. It's breaking mm -hmm. God's law. It's rebellion against God. It, it, it not only breaks God's heart, he's angry, not simply with the sin, but with the sinner. And he punishes such people in hell forever. And we're told, you can't tell people that. And it's like this at the school not too long ago where a mom, yes, my boy's a sinner, but don't don't tell him that or don't make a big deal over his sins because that'll drive him away from the faith and we want him to know Jesus. Okay, we have so many misunderstandings going on there. Here are Adam and Eve in paradise and they have broken God's law. Shall God not tell them they're sinners? Shall he just... Walk by whistling, waving, and walk on his way and leave them to themselves. Is that what we want? Shall we want a Jesus who comes in our midst and says, you know, I love you. And, you know, there, there's there's something wrong here, but I'm not going to, I don't want to make you feel bad. <laughs> so um, just this know This is not that, a recipe for conflict resolution and peace in no. any relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try to make it such in every relationship. Mm -hmm. Just love the person and and that'll fix everything. Uh, and, and man's problem is not that he's a sinner, not that he's a rebel. He's, what are the words? He's broken. He's lonely. Uh, he's friendless. He's um, alienated. Sick. 
Pick a word. Mm -hmm. What else have you heard? What what else have you heard presented as man's chief need right now, the 21st century? Mostly I hear broken, sometimes broken? sick. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Or he's, he's been, it's often also things been done to him. Mm. Oh. So he is abused or he is traumatized mm -hmm. or. He's a victim. Those sorts of things. Yes, victim is very much the victim is huge. Somebody else has done things to him and that's his problem. It's not in him, it's outside of him. And the the problem, one of the many, many problems with this is that it admits no solution. Mm -hmm. You you mm -hmm. can't undo some of these things, and some of them are far beyond fixing. And you know what? Even if okay, you're poor, we give you a million dollars. You know how well that works? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Back in the, I don't know, 50s or 60s, when um, this kind of thinking was was fresh and people were excited about the war on poverty, someone decided to build a whole bunch of condos for poorer people so that they would have nice places to live with the idea if we give them a nice place to live, they will rise to that expectation and 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 it will work transformation. Well, within a few months... The whole the whole facility was trashed, abused, destroyed, because the problem wasn't the environment. The problem was that people were unthankful, ungrateful, lazy, violent by nature, and didn't want to work and didn't want to maintain a good environment. And so they destroyed the whole thing. People sat back and scratched their head. But we gave them everything they could want, kind of like Adam and Eve in paradise. <laughs> For those of us who know the Bible and actually believe it, those kind of things are not surprising. Mm -hmm. The problem with homeless people is, well, th there are a number of things that are problems with them, but one of the biggest problems most often is that they are people who hate God, hate their neighbor, hate their family, hate church if they ever got near it, hate to work, and love being perpetually high. The, the only thing that can break that is the power of the gospel. And, and until you confront them with, this is not a poor you issue. This is a moral issue. You're a sinner in rebellion against God. You're not the worst of sinners. There's all kinds of people who do this and worse. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't free you. You are a sinner and you need to repent of your sins and you need to throw yourselves on the mercy of God in Christ. And God mm -hmm. can fix this. He can fix you. You have to want to be fixed at a mm -hmm. fundamental and heart level. And it's not that all of the things the bad things that happen to people are not problems. No. It's just that the essence of the truth is that their relationship with God is the biggest problem. And that's mm -hmm. an act of faith to acknowledge that, that yeah. it's trusting God to believe that what is most core to who we are is our relationship to God. Everything else is secondary, no matter how crazy, huge, hurtful, mm -hmm. It is. And it truly is. Yes. It's, there are, there not, are horrible, despicable yeah. things that we do to one another and that we do to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And yet the question is, well, why did that happen? Was it a fluke? Was it a cosmic accident? Or did people do these things because they hate God? Because they also hate God, yes. <laughs> because they also hate God. Yeah. And, and what's the way out of this? Well, I need to stop hating God. I need to start loving him. And, they, and then maybe I can go to them and tell them the same thing, or maybe somebody else will do it. But that's that. This is not just a, a a question of moral philosophy of check box, love God, hey God. This is a question of throwing yourself in true repentance on the mercy of God, and saying I'm a sinner, I've rebelled against you, I pretended it was something else, and it's not. I just hate you, and I would like that to change. I would like to be forgiven. I would like to be a new person. And the the encouragement we have is that if you're doing that, God's already at work in you because the the mm -hmm. the flesh never does that. Uh, the man, as he comes from Adam, does not make those admissions. Admissions does not claim that mercy, does not turn to God for help in any real sense. He may say words, um, but he does not humble himself and, and open his heart and admit, I'm a sinner and I deserve hell. And God's the only one that can get me out of this. So does God have promises for me? At which point we turn and say, he absolutely he has promises for mm -hmm. you. And the fact that you're asking is good news. It probably means he's at work in you right now. And what he will do beyond that, you don't know everything in this life, but there will be stuff. There will be good stuff that will happen along with some hard stuff. But we know in glory, in the resurrection, all the pain will be gone forever. All the hurt will be gone. You will be right. You will be glorious. 
we have we have promises that are eternal in the heavens but it starts with admitting that what the bible says about sin is real and until we say that we have no good news we have nice news mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and nice news doesn't save anybody so with and this, on that note <laughs> on that note well, this laid out before us we're ready for the next week where we'll start talking about the nature of redemption a little more thoroughly Lovely. We can look forward to that. All right, let's close off with some recommendations. Well, I can go because I have one. It's a, a smaller request than in the past, but as I was thinking about this topic and preparing for it and our need to understand the depth of sin, um, I was reminded of the hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. Mm -hmm. And I particularly love Fernanda Ortega's version of it because it captures the emotion of it. But the third verse says, uh, you who think of sin but lightly, mm -hmm. um, nor suppose the evil great, here may view its nature rightly, and its guilt may estimate, mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load. And it was reminding me that we will diminish Christ and his glory in his sacrifice if we diminish sin. Um, and so it's it's a beautiful reminder of just how much Christ chose to suffer, but that he needed to suffer because of us. So there's my, my recommendation for today. I'm going to choose a related recommendation, which is a poem by George Herbert, Love 3. <laughs> uh, another aspect of the same truth. Okay, this is um, this is my recommendation. I'm actually going to read it because it's a little hard to find online. I found out that, in fact, do you two ladies remember the poem Invictus? I think it came up out mm, of the night yeah. that covers me, black as a pole from pole to pole. I think whatever gods mm -hmm. may be for my unconquerable soul, mm -hmm. it ends with it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Ooh, uh, Dorothy Dix wrote a. Um, or Dorothy Day, I'm sorry, uh, wrote a response, and I'm going to read it. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since his the sway of circumstance, I would not wince or cry aloud under the rule which men call chance. My head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him, and his the A that, spite the menace of the years, keeps and will keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared from punishments the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. I think that fits in here someplace. Very lovely. <laughs> Can you tell we've all been thinking about poetry this week? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Why? can't imagine mm. this week we the three of us got to judge a poetry contest of school children which is always my favorite day of the school year bar none <laughs> um, but thank you both so much for this conversation it's been a pleasure uh, great thanks also to david our producer and my lawfully wedded husband thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling uh, we appreciate you very much and thank you listener for tuning in hope you'll join us again next time